that out very soon. Well, you know, there's a, there's a, there's another thing too. I've had over the last 20 years so many cameras on me. Oh lord. Oh. I'm at the point where it's okay. Well, that's good. Camera. Yeah. So you're you're actually cool with it. Well, that's nice. We've that's had good. I've had cameras in extremely invasive that can be done to me anymore. Like, this is exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> It is. Nightshade presents Dr. Burrish blamed for La Quinta fire. Oh, <laughs> lovely. George Knapp here. Oh, Reporting lovely. From La Quinta. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Um, what we and I'm very pleased to be with Dan Burrish. There. And I'm just uh, use myself. well, actually, I would like you to you to to, to sort of give a, a brief inter introduction, uh, who you are, and what you're known for. Maybe what, what you'd like for, to be known for? Aside from cantankerous activities uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, disobeying uh, certain uh, authority structures. No, well, I'm a microbiologist, a, um, a retired one now, but continuing somewhat the practice involved in a uh, very unusual project called Lotus. Um, I am a 20-year retiree from uh, Majestic first having been brought in in 1986 under the auspices of the Committee of the Majority um, and uh, specifically working for the Majestic 12 uh, assigned to Project Aquarius. I suppose I'm more known for meeting a J-Rod uh, and working at S4. Uh, aside from that, I don't really know what I'm known for aside from irritating a bunch of people on the web that don't want to hear about me. Okay, so you, you worked for Majestic, and and you were basically, I mean, in brief, and I, I know there's a really long history right. as the to Lotus how you ended. Right, was an accessory project. It wasn't, you know, I, it, was, it was funded because everything that I was doing at the time was being funded ultimately by them. But uh, it was an accessory project. It wasn't something of a critical nature for... Uh, for the Majestic, or as I believed for a long time. However, the principle of the Lotus ultimately ended up being a rather uh, earth-shaking item for the participants at the, the T9 conference a couple of years ago. Um, what is the T9 conference? During the course of, of um, speaking with extraterrestrials and our, our interactions with them from the 1950s onward, there have been a series of treaties established between we and they, uh, they meaning a future human intelligence, time travelers. Uh, and there have been a, a uh, as a consequence of our relationship with them, there have been more than one treaty system in place. Uh, during the last of one of those treaty negotiation and signing times, I had the privilege of being uh, in the presence of the negotiators uh, at the conference, which was held in the state of New Mexico. And there were how many aliens present at that time? Uh, there were two, four, six, and a few in the strollers behind the, uh, the curtains. So we had... A uh, few in stroll. I'm sorry, what was that reference? They're, they're unable to cope for long periods of time in our atmosphere. In our present atmosphere, uh, they've adapted, if you will, to the atmospheres of their their particular future timeline, and and as a consequence, uh, coming here would be oppressive uh, to them, existing in our in our standard temperature and our pressure. Uh, so they have um, been provided uh, unique sealed off pressurized systems. Huh. that they would be moved around in uh, by their attendants, basically on a Segway type, uh, it type uh, transport system, where you can push it and it will actually move forward very easily, maneuverable. I see, so that's what you meant by stroller right. system. Right, right. Okay. And so they were encapsulated in their strollers and their positions as negotiators for their, their, um, their time. And... Um, Are you saying that these aliens that were present present at this conference that happened, what, this year, last year? A couple year? years. A couple yeah. years ago, um, in which they discussed, I'm assuming, your, it was Between the Lotus... Between 2003 and 2004. I'm sorry? Between 2003 and 2004. Okay, and they discussed the, uh, the Lotus Project. It was brought up, and in fact, um, 
as part of the negotiations, the P plus 45,000 uh, group of J-Rods wanted the codes for the Lotus Principle added into the treaty negotiations so that they could use it in their own attempts to ameliorate their particular neuropathies. Wow, so they, they saw the value. It. They saw the value right away. They saw a potential value for it and they mm -hmm. wanted to use it for that purpose. It was my argument that it should not be used uh, for a particular purpose. That this is moreover part of a natural system which has been put in place by whatever God that one would want to uh, deign as being the, the creator of the universe um, as part of a natural system and not to be controllable by humankind. Um, in or so by doing, alien kind? By, well, they're, know, they're, by they're humans. They're, they're, they're okay, human you lineage. consider them humans? They're humans. Okay. The human beings, so, albeit different from what we uh, would expect to see as a human being, but then again, if we look in the history, the, the presently accepted history of the evolution of humankind, if one were to walk uh, uh, into a, um, a conference held by uh, Neanderthals, one would be taken aback. Well, in the same way, one may be taken aback by walking into a conference with these gentlemen. Okay. Um, so you've got two kinds of aliens, and people that are watching this, some people may have no idea about the, the T2, the t two timelines. Probably, probably not. We actually had three kinds of extraterrestrials, human lineage extraterrestrials present. Uh, two kinds of P plus 45,000 years from now, if we were to translate over to timeline two. Difficult subjects, aren't they? Uh, two representatives from that time, two representatives from P plus 52,000 years ahead, J-Rods, both of which generally um, have the, the anatomical configuration of what would be in ufology called grays, okay. gray aliens, uh, and two representatives from P plus 52,000 Orions, who would generally, I guess, in ufological circles, I guess one could say, would be called Nordics or, or Talls. Okay. Uh, and, who and actually look there? more human like but have larger eyes, very blue eyes, blondish hair, etc. I see. And, um, okay, well, of, of course I've got many questions on this score. Um, so do I. <laughs> but. And for people listening, we, we would also like to know, were there any reptilians present? No, not per se. Okay. What, what I've, I've come to understand, and, and it's generally held, I think I could say it's generally held within our, our society, that the notion of a reptilian is a misnomer. And I'm not saying that to apply a negative uh, connotation to the to the stories that individuals have brought forward, probably mostly forthrightly, um, but that when you view or observe um, what would be called a gray, what I would call a J rod. Um, the particular ruddy configuration of their skin, the changes of the, the, the pseudoriferous glandular structure of their, of their skin, can make them appear during exacerbations of the illness very reptilian in appearance and also possibly praying mantis type uh, in appearance. They, they had, they're also suffering from a cocaine-like syndrome, which makes them lurch forward, so they appear very praying mantis-like. Um, so I think that possibly many of the accounts which have forthrightly come uh, from individuals whom have actually been abducted by the P-45s have may, maybe been interpreted as being reptilian in appearance because of their their skin structure but they're not really reptiles okay. now I'm not saying I'm trying to be inclusive here that there are things in the the mind of man and in the glorious universe of God that I don't know that that there's a possibility that 
individuals have been um, have encountered alien species not to my reference given the fact I mean you know gosh I've had to accept the fact that there are human beings that many years ahead of us on another timeline coexisting in reality how hard would it be for me to accept that there are other extraterrestrials of non-human lineage of which I've only been briefed about one which is an extra dimensional species whom have referenced other extraterrestrial species that I know nothing about mm -hmm. how hard is it for me to accept that after I've been in the presence of a human lineage extraterrestrial I, I don't have a problem with that but at the same time I don't have evidence to support it either reptilian in that if one were under stress and one had no previous reference to their biology uh, their pathophysiology their, their particular problems one could reasonably expect uh, out of a group of people experiencing them that more than 50% of the group could have probably say that they were reptilian in appearance. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. That's the best I so can say. So their appearance morphs to some degree into more of a reptilian well, under stress, is, is what well, you're saying? I'm I mean, saying maybe that people you don't like could the interpret morph. them that way. Okay. Reasonably be expected Visually. to interpret them that way if they do not have a scientific grounding in what they're looking at. Sure. You know, I'm trying not to. I'm trying to be inclusive of of reports of individuals that have no reason to have come forward and say things that they've said uh, for other than the fact that they've experienced something. I'm trying to understand, or maybe uh, uh, help people to understand why they may have interpreted it as well. Sure. These things in this way. However, they may have actually come into contact with something which was fully reptilian in appearance. I don't know. I haven't. Exactly. You know, um, I'm trying to be honest and at the same time tell people, because apparently it's happened to me, that it's okay. That apparently that they what's were abducted happened. abducted and, and uh, that it's happened. Okay. That apparently what to. has happened to you? Well... Uh, in, in 1973, I was playing in a park in Southern California in Mayboy Park, and um, this is going to probably come out in one or more of the versions of the debriefing with me. I was playing um, baseball with my grandpa in the park, and I was having him throw me a, a ball so I could catch it over my shoulder. I was trying to run away at the same time that he would throw the ball so I could try to catch the ball like Willie Mays is famous catches. Uh, during one of these throws of the ball, um, I remember looking up toward the sun because it was high in the, in the sky at the time. It was summertime. And glancing away because the sun was blinding me, looking down toward the grass, which was very bright green at the time, and then seeing a flash where the grass appeared to turn black. I appeared, uh, from my perspective, I was, I was covered in a shadow. The shadow reminded me of a triangular bat kite that I had played with with uh, my grandfather over the riverbed nearby. And that's the way I basically was able to describe it at the time. I was, what, nine? I was nine at the time. Um... Then I remember a flash, immediately there's a disjoint memory of this, it's not contiguous, where I saw my grandfather sitting over by a tree several yards away from me and the sun had clearly moved in its aspect to me so time had clearly passed. The earth had moved and time had passed, at least several hours had passed. He was very shook up. I ran over to him, asked him what happened, and he didn't want to talk about it. He said, you're okay now, you're okay now, and he wanted to go home. So he walked me home immediately over the overpass, over Delamo Boulevard, 
and we went home. This precipitated a major uh, domestic upset between my grandparents and my mom and dad. Ultimately, this domestic upset resulted in my grandparents moving out. At around that same time, um, I was having unusual dreams. And in the dream, I would wake up. Do I think that there were probably dreams now? No. But I would wake up and I would walk from my bedroom through the restroom, which connected between my bedroom and a small laundry area that went to a doorway off the north side of uh, our house. And to the right of that laundry area, there was a, um, a closet. That's the closet where my grandpa used to put his work jacket and his work boots. He worked at Gaffers and Sattlers as a, an enamel dipper. Um, dipping pieces uh, in enamel for uh, manually uh, for um, things like uh, appliances, stoves, etc. And he would come home every day just covered in enamel dots all over his jacket and his boots. And I would open the door to that closet and that's all I can remember from the dream. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I was meeting somebody called Harry. He was a little friend. And I know that as knowledge that I met a little friend there, but I have no visual memory of what Harry looked like. It was finally, because um, I, I finally told my mom and dad about it, and it was finally rationalized a way that I was, because I was still watching um, Sesame Street at the time, that was Oscar the Grouch. And that's the way um, uh, my mom put it. She said, you're thinking about Oscar the Grouch because he looks furry and hairy. And from that time on, as the dreams continued, I then remember seeing Oscar the Grouch in my dream, but not in the closet, um, in the restroom, or, you know, past the restroom. But I remember just seeing a picture of Oscar the Grouch, so I felt very calm about it after that. I, you know, I accepted it as a boy. Um, so how? Okay, so you were in, you were abducted in 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 something that you don't remember the details of. Is that the actual experience? Once yeah, I told you what the time. the actual yeah the actual uh, memory of it uh, from my boyhood. That is it. Uh, now, I remember possibly, and I'm not sure over the years with, whether this was confabulation or not, because I was a boy at the time. I think I remember seeing a tall person, like if you take a movie frame, like one frame, like a fr flash of a still picture, mm -hmm. like an iconic memory almost, uh, of a tall person standing next to him at the tree. Next to your, your grandpa? My grandpa. Yeah, okay. and uh, he refused until the day he passed to discuss what happened. He would become extremely agitated. And John and Doty, uh, Doty for certain, who had many conversations uh, with him, and maybe even John would... Uh, um, this is your father and mother. You're yeah, about. Uh, yeah. Uh, they're my mom and dad that I grew up with. Now, I've learned certain things about my family since then that are really neither here nor there, having to do with who was actually biological father and biological mother and things like that. But they were my mom and dad. They're my mom and dad. I mean, they're the mom and dad that I remember growing up with, and, and uh, I... Uh, but they are not MJ1. No, no Okay, but no. And M MJ1, it, somehow this this abduction occur, appear, yeah. um, experience seemed to have resulted in you becoming or being viewed as the son of MJ1, is right, that correct? Right, right. What happened, what happened is this. Uh, I, I also learned of what happened to me uh, from Kaela the J-Rod that I met at S4. He showed me from his perspective what had happened to me in 1973. I saw myself being pulled by my chest upward off the surface of the park. 
I saw my grandfather going like this and and uh, basically panicking, uh, um, crying, because he wasn't able. My grandpa was very protective of me, and he wasn't able to protect me. And now I understand, God bless him, why he was so upset. The one person in his whole life that he knew that he would protect, that he loved that much to protect, he couldn't at that moment. And I understand why he was so upset. But the J-Rod showed me what happened to me, that I was picked up and that I was laid down on a table in some sort of a craft. Uh, and that this craft was a, a generally... Um, uh, chevron shaped uh, almost triangular uh, shaped craft and I was laid down uh, next to a series of young people one of which was in fact the son of the former MJ1 something went wrong during uh, the, the course of my time on board the craft when samples were being taken of me uh, for their studies and the son um, of the former MJ-1 died. During that time, they put some sort of equipment on me. It almost looked like um, uh, EEG type, uh, um, uh, a neural net, if you will, um, of receivers, probes, um, uh, electrodes, if you will, on me. And they were trying to save, desperately trying to save, and I could see the, the, the movement of the J-Rods around this other boy. And I, I, I know what he looked like and all of that because I was seeing it through the eyes of, of Kaila. Um, they were trying to save him and he ultimately passed. During that time, apparently they were trying with whatever technology that they employ to, to save uh, the boy by storing him. Uh, that Kaila was uh, with the P-45s at the time. These were P-45, 1,000 J-Rods. And they looked at us, and they look at us as, as no more than uh, a, um, containers or, or um, cylinders almost, almost like beakers full of material, of electromagnetic material. And so they were trying to save store his, his energy, if you will, um, right. R.C. has suggested the word vessels, right. Um, they were trying to store him for a while, I guess, in me. Now, my memory of, of myself at the time was a rather dull boy that liked to play uh, baseball uh, and uh, with G.I. Joes and things like that. The, the record of me at the time was that I had an okay acuity in science. That's what the, the, uh, the elementary school teachers were saying. I don't remember having acuity like that in science. And there's a disjoint in my own story of myself because of this. Because after I was put down uh, back in the park, over the course of the next couple of years, there were changes in me, but then again there should have been because I was growing up. But there was a, a, a substantive intellectual change in me where I was no longer interested in those same things of my youth. Was that maturation? Probably some of it. Was it a change as a result of what was done with me on board the craft? The Majestic thinks so, thinks that it had something to do with that other boy because that other boy was uh, known as um, very bright in the sciences. And all of a sudden, true enough, I got a hankering for Erlenmeyer flasks and boiling flasks and microscopes that I had never had before. Okay, but and I've uh, possessed ever since. On some level, the MJ one's son that was on the craft next to you that that uh, possibly received uh, a soul transfer from um, is the MJ 
the MJ group had to be cognizant of what was going on. In other words... They knew that that had happened. And they um, knew during the time... He's admitted to me that they knew that that had happened at the time. But in other words, was this... Um, uh, so you were chosen, in a sense. I believe that I was... The only evidence... I don't know. Sure. I don't know. The, the, the evidence that I have was that I was from hearing about the sampling program was that I was picked up as a as a random population sample um, the son of a blue collar worker and just the son of the, the, my family was was total blue collar uh, but there are a lot of coincidences that suggest that people were moved into a place to later teach me that happened before 1973. Can I put my finger on that and say, oh yeah, they knew what was going to happen to me and that I was going to be picked up? I can't say that because I wouldn't be honest. But I get the feeling as though, oh, Marcia has held up two letters to me, LG, for looking glass. Oh, she I knows see. More. I see. see. I see. I'm sitting here in the presence of an individual that actually knows more of the truth and cannot tell me for whatever reason more of the truth about what's happened to me than I know. Okay. She's just held up the word, the, the letters LG for looking glass. She's indicating to me that they knew. In other words, and looking glass is the ability to look into the future. So what you're suggesting it's is a that MJ for that use, yeah. MJ12 was using looking glass, perhaps saw that the son that the first son of MJ1 was going to die and planned to groom you to to carry on it's possible in his place on It's someone. possible. Mm -hmm. But I've never been told by them that. Did J. Rod? Excuse me, but when the hints were... have been, you know, forthcoming that that is the reality involved. Because, I mean, even, and I don't know for certain that he was ever uh, read into the program. Uh, God bless him, Jim, uh, my mentor, Dr. Jim Reynolds. Um, he was moved into places that almost set him up perfectly for Dodie's call, my mom's call that day to talk with him at Long Beach Memorial Hospital and she has since admitted she, she admitted to Marcy that uh, she received a sum of money there are some not good things here and, uh, and I still love them both for everything that they've done for me but yet there's an in incompatibility now because I'm still the eight or nine year old boy in their eyes that they are willing to try to take sovereignty away from and it produces an incompatibility in the relationship. What we're trying to find out though is how did you hook up with MJ1 after that? I mean, well, The first time that I saw him was at the back of the uh, meeting room at the George C. Page Museum when I was a member of the Los Angeles Microscopical Society. How old were you? Thirteen, fourteen. So it was a few there. years after. It was a few years after, after I started becoming really interested in all of the beakers and the microscopes and things like that, where I was introduced to Jim Reynolds at Long Beach Memorial Medical Center. Jim Reynolds then introduced my mom and myself to John De Haas, who was then an associate professor of uh, protozoology, as I understand, at the University of Southern California. He was also the head of De Haas Optical, uh, a microscope salesman, who then put me in contact with the Los Angeles Microscopical Society at the George C. Page Museum, with whom he was associated as a member, as a senior member, in fact, at the time. Uh, during the course of my association with the LA Micro Society, I saw the former MJ1 walk in the back doorway. I sat at the back right of the room, 
which was where my spot kind of was. And I noticed him just standing back there, and, and he kind of just blended in with the crowd that was kind of coming and going. And he looked at me, and I looked at him because I, I noticed he was, he was laying a little too long of a gaze on me. And I was paranoid as it was. I was scared to death just being around these bright people. Uh, these were accomplished scientists. Uh, Zane Price was one of them, who was the head of the Electron Micro Lab at UCLA. I mean, these were accomplished people. And I noticed he laid this gaze on me from the back of the room, and he took his lighter, and he lit, he opened it, it was a Zippo lighter, and it had a United States Navy seal on it. And he just popped it and lit it, and closed it up, and walked out the back door. I had no idea who this dude was. Scared to ask anybody because I didn't want to look stupid. You know, I was a geeky teen. Later on, I find out that he just wanted to introduce himself to me early on. He wanted to see where I was in my life at the time. Now, of course, the association was already established because of the son Michael and all of that business from 73. This was like 1975, 76, mm -hmm. right in that general time frame. So, okay. So that's my first forward. meeting with him, but I, I didn't really meet with him at the time. He showed himself to me. I understand. And you have since developed a relationship with him such that is there is affection there and he does consider you his son. Um, he treats me very son-like, yes. Okay. Uh, but, but would you also say that, that it's his, um, you know, he regards you as his son, literally, or does, I mean, he must be conscious of the, the shift. Or the transfer he's, he's, that took place. He's, 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 he knows what happened on board. We've okay. had long discussions about this. Okay. Um, in fact, during a short, well, we, we had an, an entire night discussion about it, one night. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to do the right things by everybody. And that's the only reason why, um, to be honest, I mean, you know, my debriefing must come out to the public to the extent that the authentic message, the truthful message of what I've saw, what I've seen, comes out. Uh, and that concerns the extraterrestrial issue. But the rest of it, my losing my knees out at Mayboyer Park and falling at the base of the tree where my grandpa was, that's not required. But for people to know that it's not bullshit, that there's a real human being behind it, as messed up as they are, probably more. But yeah, they, they ought to know that. I'm, I'm going to tell you honestly, when I saw Bill Hamilton's segment interview with you, and you're, you're talking about your relationship with J-Rod and how you... Um, communicated with him telepathically, um, that struck me as incredibly real. And from that point on, I was very interested in what you had to say. Because I said, this man, this man really experienced this. This is, this is, not, uh, this is not bullshit. This is, this is the real thing. So um, if you could reiterate kind of how you started working with J-Rod. Well, uh, he was working with me before I ever knew it. Of course, he was on board, as I understand. I have no memory of him directly, but I mean, uh, as I understand, in 73. Uh, he had traveled to 73. And then, uh, this is even what I said to Jeff Ransom on, on the phone. You know, I said, my God, if this doesn't boggle, I mean, it boggles my mind when you think about paradoxes to start with. Um, that he traveled to 73, I was picked up, and then he subsequently traveled back to the 53 time frame, and there was a crash, which means that he was held at S4 in 1973 at the time that I was playing baseball with my grandpa, and that he was also on board the craft, impinging into our time, lifting me up. Prosaically, I mean, it sounds crazy, but you know, it's a paradox, I guess. I mean, but um, 
I, I actually came into direct contact with him at the uh, end of uh, 1993, start of 94. Yeah, there, there's something wrong with him. Um, during the entirety of my experience around him, he appeared, uh, the best that I can describe is off-shifted. Almost like, well, I mean, he was physical. I, I felt him through a glove. There was matter there with me, but almost like he was a ghost with a body. He didn't belong. He did not belong where he was. Um, yet, when he would communicate, when he would do the entrainment, um, they thump you. Almost, it, it's almost acoustically. They thump you. And until they finally come into contact with the brain level waves where they can begin communicating. And it comes in waves. It's almost like clicks of a dolphin. It comes in waves. And then you feel yourself pulled in as the entrainment is occurring, that the perception is being pulled into his eyes. Um, very unwieldy feeling. But then they entrain, bringing, bringing you down to relaxate, you know, relaxed almost to a theta state, like an eight hertz type theta state, where you're very, almost like drowsy, and they tell you, you know, they're not gonna hurt you. He did that, he actually said that he would not harm me when he stepped forward on me when we were doing the, the old bride's uh, dance, as we nicknamed it, where I, would, I was supposed to step forward to him, almost like taking a bride's step up the aisle. And then he did the thing back to me, almost jokingly, but it was so unwieldy because he broke the protocol. It's like everything that had been established of trust at that moment, it went to hell. And uh, I got so afraid. There was a... a an animal response in me at that moment, a very, very human animalistic response of get me the hell out of here. And I stepped backward and fell backward onto my back. And that is really what I perceive myself as doing. I, I said to Jeff, I said, felt like I was a cockroach, you know, lying on my back in there. And he walked up onto me. And I heard them yelling, fire the repress. They were going to into mess him. They were going to hurt him so that he wouldn't hurt me. And I was trying to yell no, and I'm not even sure to this day if I really yelled no or if it was just in my mind. The, the stress was that bad at the moment. Um, and he walked, literally walked up onto me and sat on my chest. He didn't knock me over. I mean, there was, I think Ron or a couple other people said, oh, you know, he knocked you over in the, uh, in the clean space. He, he couldn't knock me over. He was too weak. Uh, to knock me over. He, he, even if he wasn't given his size, he couldn't have knocked me over. And how tall was he? Uh, just a little over three feet hunched down, uh -huh. almost four feet if he was to be extended out lengthwise, if he would be lying on his back and extended out lengthwise. But the malady, the, the, the uh, pathologies uh, under which he was suffering caused him to uh, have um, um, weakness, change of gait, change of stance, where most of the time he was extremely hunched over forward and he really couldn't stand up straight. When he would walk, he would wobble and kind of shuffle. He was so, very so he Ill, got on your chest, he, he walked onto your chest, he or walked, sat on your chest. He was actually sitting on my, my um, abdomen area, but he was leaning forward with his hands onto my chest. Was he down. Uh, so he was communicating at that moment that he wasn't going to hurt you? Yes, he, he said, I, I, I won't hurt you, be any. He called me be any. And that goes to, it, it be any. He, he broke English up very strangely. Um, and you heard this in your head, I'm assuming. I'm assuming I heard it, it, in it, my it head. wasn't out loud. No, I heard it in my head, in my own introspective voice, but clearly not coming from me. Um, you know the sound of yourself when you talk to yourself, self-talk? It, it's the same sound, except it's the wrong linguistics, it's the wrong wording. You can tell it's not you. And initially when that happens, too, 
there is a, uh, uh, from my perspective, initially when it was happening, there was a very panicky feeling. But, of course, that initially happened when I was part of the B-Unit team when Stephen was still going in to the clean sphere. He looked at me through the clean sphere and spoke to me and said, I remember and hello. Meaning to me. he, the person who it was, uh, you call, what, what is his name again? The J Rod looked at you. Kayla. Kayla yeah. looked at you when you when Steve was in the clean sphere with yeah. him. He turned around and looked at you. Yeah, he turned around and looked at me. I was part of the B unit team to start with. In fact, that was going to be my actual occupation in there. Was assisting the chief scientist and in going into the clean sphere until he identified me as somebody, I guess, special to him, Kayla, and he wanted me to be the person to go in there. That's why I was promoted ultimately to the working group leader in there because I didn't have the background, did not have the seniority, uh, and it was not my place. Um, but that's why the, the promotion happened. It was okay, those, so well, to a go lot of back, promotions happen in the world, I think. But <laughs> so, but to go back the to Peter where, principle. <laughs> um, he's so he went onto your chest. He told you he wasn't going to hurt you. Did they did they actually zap him then, or did they? I don't believe so because I would have felt. He, he began to entrain me immediately and strongly, and he relaxed me. The, the uh, encephalins, the endorphins were going big time. They, they, they entrain on several levels, and they're able to relax you by actually flooding you with natural opiates. Mm -hmm. um, like a runner's high. Right. So what happened after that? You, I'm assuming or you got to... Or the high that you receive uh, as you're going through natural death process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you naturally kick yeah. out the, you know. Yeah. Um, but okay. So, but what happened after that? Uh, after that, I began to sink away from what was going on in the clean sphere, and with the panic that was going on over the radios, because I heard them. There, we had two separate units: an A unit and a B unit on the radio. They were like separate uh, radio frequencies, and uh, I could push the button and talk independently. But they were stepping over each other, screaming, saying get a secondary unit ready to get me out of there, they were going to enter in to pull me out. And you can't just step in there that quickly. I mean, they've got to suit somebody up, bring them in, and you knew before you were going in there that the J-Rod, uh, we were trained that they were a threat. Really? And so that we were not supposed to communicate privately with them or anything like that, that we had a certain job to do and we were to get it done. And that was the scientific job of removing the, the samples and then the studying of the samples for, for the back engineering use of the, the um, uh, reversing like chemicals. The idea was to reverse uh, his an illness that, that he and the, his people have, which yeah, we is were, the 52? The 52s. And, and what we were trying to do initially, jumping off onto the biology a little bit, what we were trying to do is we were trying to actually strip the exterior cytoplasm off from the cells and and uh, produce cells which would be independently functioning then to understand those cells biochemically genetically so that those cells could then be re-added as a graft into the J-Rod to attempt to ameliorate the the neuropathy that's what one of the the, the, the stated goals was <laughs> easier said than done but um, so, okay. we were told, though, that if something would go wrong in there, there would be no immediate fix. Um, you, you weren't a million miles away, but you were several thousand when you were inside there. So you were very alone, even though you had radio communication. It was essentially being uh, isolated on the space shuttle, if you will. And not that easily, you know, easy to get you home. Uh, because they had to do all of the repressurizations of the gantry, bring somebody new in, then get you out, then get you uh, detox, the, the, the cleansing, um, the decontamination, and then get you out of there, then get you out of the suit, then give you medical treatment. So we're talking a couple hours. So if something goes wrong in there, and they're potentially able to harm you because of the, the entrainment, you're dead, and that's you accepted before you ever uh, accepted going in there. And but to a large part, it wasn't 
you know, it wasn't bravado on our part saying it's no big thing, but you had to accept that just to work inside the facility. Um, you knew that if there was a, um, a contamination, if the alarms started going off, the old joke was get in a straight back chair and lean way over and kiss your goodbye. It was over. Because if the alarm started going off, you were sealed into the facility and they were going to pump the gas in and fire the fuel air device. Boom. That's what the, that's what the explosive valves were for, the so-called escape tunnels. Uh, for you to get out in case there was an emergency, those were blow-off vents. So they could blow off and explode the facility blow off out of the, the papoose range and keep the remainder of the facility intact. So, but your experience with the J-Rod and the other ones you've met have, has basically, was it, were you afraid for your life at any time? In other words, I was afraid for my life when he stepped toward me, absolutely I was. At that moment? At that moment, but it was a very transient, um, you know, it was, a very, it was an ephemeral uh, moment. Um, How did you? It, it passed off very quickly because biochemistry helped me calm down when he trained me. How did you feel, though, in your sort of interactions with him? Um, in other words, do you feel that you said you didn't remember knowing him in the original meeting no. in the spaceship, right? Right. But he remembered clearly. He remembered. So, did you feel that the your French you actually developed a friendship with? Oh, with I this absolutely being? did. And I that it grew did. over time, or did you feel that it was instantly there? That's a good question. Uh, I'll say that I felt a kinship to him all along from the time that he first looked over at me. Um, and that may have been a consequence of me being picked up in the park. That may have been. My trust in what he was saying to me grew over time. Because I remember asking you that. Yeah, my, my, my trust grew over time. But, but there was, a, there was an extant level. kinship uh -huh. there with him. Uh -huh. And I think that may have started because of the, of the, the pickup in 73. Uh, I think. But I'm, I'm trying to surmise it. Um, there was a, a pickup of the, the jovial nature of our friendship over time, certainly. Uh, because I've got kind of a, a strange sense of humor, and he was able to um, be friends with that kind of same weird sense of humor, where he would look over at me, and he would tell me that what his behavior was, because I, I couldn't tell when he was happy or when he was sad because of physical characteristics that easily. Um, you know, you can you can tell fairly quickly with a, with a, a human being from now if they're happy, if they're smiling at you. But I couldn't tell if that was pain or what it was on his face until he specifically informed me that uh, that's his smile, that's his laugh. As that grew, and my 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 relationship with him grew, I became more attuned to his physical responses as well, and I think that picked our friendship up as well because um, I'm more associating with another human being with the physical reactions as well you know in the communication and they were less so so that was difficult that was very difficult until I became attuned where I became more relaxed you know what his physical responses were when I knew he was laughing after that then that got me into trouble um, with the folks in the facility because I reacted naturally to his physical responses. And so I would smile or whatever over at him and they would say, what is transpiring between you two? I'd hear it come over the radio. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would out and out lie to them and say nothing because I was afraid, I, had a, I did, I had a fear of losing his friendship too because I wanted to learn more from him. And so I was willing 
And these are the same people that, you know, will point a gun at, uh, uh, at me with very little compunction against it. I was willing to befriend him too because he was a captive there as I was feeling too a captive within Majestic because I had been brought into a program that I had no clue before what I was being brought into. So I felt kind of uh, trespassed against too. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you had a camaraderie in that sense. Um, yeah, we were both prisoners in our own right. Did you think that he, he had the ability to uh, protect you? No. I, in fact, it, it was, if anything, it was the other way around. Oh. Um, I was covering for him, and a lot of his anger, because he had anger in him too, and pain, and anger is a result of pain from the samples being removed. I was covering for him by not telling them of the anger because then they would have followed an operant conditioning protocol that had been set in against him to penalize him. So I was actually protecting him. So, but did, he was did a human he... being for Christ's sake. I mean, it, it, if you get stuck with a needle enough times, you get perturbed. And when you're being treated like crap on top of it, a prisoner is a prisoner. In what way was he treated like crap, as you put it? If he wouldn't respond as they told him, they would fire a repress valve and change the pressurization in the clean sphere, causing mild to moderate intumescence, a change of pressure in his skin, because he was of lesser density, physical density, as in, as in um, a weight per volume, that density. Uh, and the reason why I'm clarifying that is I've heard a lot of new agey comments about fourth density and fifth. I don't know about all of that. Um, as in weight per volume type density, he was he was less dense physically than we were. His bone structure was less dense than we were. So when they would fire the the repress valve or they would intumesce him, it would cause him great pain. And. I was screaming no, and I think, you know, at the time that he stepped up on, onto me, I think they thought the better of it at the moment because he was clearly in training me at that moment. So if they would have fired the, the, the pressurization at that point, I would have felt the pain that he was feeling. And it right, maybe killed you me, I don't know. You developed a, uh, from what I, I understand, you developed like the movie E.T., um, you developed the ability to actually feel his pain. I, well, it wasn't even it wasn't even developed. It was immediate. Oh, it was immediate. Um, the the thing which was developed, and I'm not sure I'm not sure it may have actually been some sort of a a neurological habituation. I'm not certain of that. But the thing which was developed was the inability to disentrain to break off from him. Um, Even when you left the clean sphere? In other words, regardless within, of where with, you within, were? Within uh, a certain range, within, you know, like a 15 meter range from him. Um, For example, right I was, now? I, I could... Right no, now, no, could no, you no, feel no, his pain? No. If you no. wanted you to feel it, could you? No, I don't believe so. I don't believe that they're... Uh, Capable. I mean, you know, we're talking now. We're talking time difference. Mm -hmm. His lack of a physical existence in our reality, and even if we're talking no time difference, we're talking about a linear distance of how far between here and reticulum. Good God! No. He's no. back at reticulum now. Yeah. As far as I'm aware. Uh -huh. As far as I'm aware. My stomach is growling. I must be getting hungry. <laughs> Um, right, okay. As far as I'm aware, that's where he returned to. That's the best information I have. And frankly, from the time that, when it happened in 2003, they they, they don't even want to discuss the matter with me because uh, it's a real sore point. I did oh, what I was not supposed to Oh, you pushed him through a time hole. Uh, I pushed him into a, a one of the Stargate units. Yeah, into the gray patch uh, between the, the posts. And that was the end at the end of your relationship with him? Well, that was the end of it. It's the last time I saw him. 
I mean, but, uh, but it was the end was of their it, relationship with him too, which is why they're so pissed off. Why but, were you motivated to push him into? He asked there? me to. He told me he wanted to go home. He wanted to see his son. So I did. So he was a prisoner, but but at some point you were in a position. I'm I'm thinking this was in Egypt. It Somehow was. you guys were were taken to Egypt. Yeah, I was flown there. Yeah. And so was he. Uh, yeah, but over a different transport. He, he was already present by the time of my arrival. Uh, there was a communication protocol going on. He was communicating something. I was never really told. All I was told was that there was a problem with his communication, and they wanted me to be there to cause him to relax or whatever to facilitate the discussion. And so they wanted me basically there as a as an idol of theatry, as an idol of the theater. They, they, they wanted me present. Um, they wanted me there uh, as a ruse of kinship with him. And had you... And the kinship was no ruse, and that's something that they, they, they misinterpreted, I guess, over the, these years, that I have more of a, um, um, a kinship with a present-day human versus him. And, and to me, although he was he was offset, although he appeared different, that he didn't belong, he's still a human being, and a human is a human is a human to me. Uh, so I had a, a, a true friendship with him. There was a true affection there between the two because he was showing me things from his childhood, and I was showing him things from mine, and we were actually enjoying each other's experience of each other, a, a, a friendship. Um, it was a true friendship, and I don't really think that Majestic ever regarded it that way. They feel themselves so damn superior, or that we're superior to them. And uh, maybe it's a reaction, I don't know, maybe I'm rationalizing it, that it's a reaction to the, to the P-45s feeling that we're inferior, the so-called rogues feeling of us, maybe it's some sort of a railing against that or a reaction against that, that they developed the attitude. I don't know, but I know that I wasn't superior to him and he wasn't superior to me. Much brighter, but we're still just human beings. And just because somebody is brighter than somebody else, it doesn't mean they're superior. So in, I'm just trying to figure out why in Egypt you, he was there. I'm obviously doing some work with them. He was there as part of, of a communication program that they had ongoing after our program, well, way after, almost a decade. Oh, after, almost 10 uh, years later. Well, I mean, it, you know, it, it had ended in 96, uh, and we had some more briefings in 97, but that was about it. So you're saying that you, uh, this happened recently that you pushed him into the Stargate? It happened at the end of 2003. And, um, you know, I, I could tell from um, the relationship with him, that he was being honest with me. Now, again, there have been those that have criticized and said, well, look, this guy is 52,000 years along and an and evolutionary line, which does not necessarily make him smarter, but certainly not better. I mean, look at the, 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 the pathology, but uh, that he had the ability, if he was a human being, to lie. Yep, and we talked with each other about lying, and Majestic never knew that. But he told me about things which would be happening in the future, uh, inconsequential, generally inconsequential things. And then there were some very consequential items. But some generally inconsequential things that happened subsequent, which told me not only was he from the future, that he had access to future material, because nobody could have predicted conversations but that he was being honest with me as well. I could feel his heart. And um, that's all we can really do. You know, they, they, they turn it into a joke on Coast to Coast. The Coast to Coast AM Challenge with Bill Burns and George Norrie. Will you step up to the plate and take this polygraph exam? No, because polygraph doesn't work. If a polygraph worked, we wouldn't need juries. We judge other people, other human beings, by their honesty, by empirical data and evidence as well, but by their spirit as well. And 
the spirit that I judged him by was what I was feeling from him, from his heart, from his mind. And I, I judged him by his relationship with his, with his child, by how he regarded his mother, by all of these things that we choose to regard in the human family to make decisions about each other. The same things. I mean, these common things were still present. So, there were very, you know, many you know, uncommon aspects to their society, uh, to the to the negating of emotion and the, the negating of personal names out in society, but still being carried within families. There was a common theme to the to the human family, which was still extant in his time, and uh, um, I used that as part of my prudent discernment of him, or God, I hope it was, that he was a good human being. So you assisted him in, in going through the Stargate. I pushed the Segway-type transport set on the stroller. Uh, they, they looked like a bell jars almost over the top of Segway-type strollers where you could, you know, almost waist, waist height where the, the bar was, where you could push it in whatever direction and it took very little effort to move it. Uh, and he asked me to go home. Um, so you pushed him, and what happened to you when you pushed him? Uh, I pushed forward, then the next feeling was a feeling of numbness. <laughs> I, for a brief moment, I thought I really screwed up, maybe killed myself or whatever, because I literally felt numb everywhere. Then I remember a flash of gray, and then I was seated coughing on a block about 20, 30 meters away maybe. And I had people rushing up to me still over dramatically actually cocking a, an automatic firearm at me, screaming at me. And I was grabbed, picked up from the, uh, the block and taken over and said, you know, you're under arrest and I mean, I committed a violation of uh, the protocols, and uh, um, you know, I was being threatened with weapons to my head and things like that. So, how did Mendes what did he say to you? And you know, are are you a spy? And they, you know, uh, I mean, you know, they were, they were just acting paranoid. No, I wasn't a spy. I just shoved him into the Stargate, and he went bye bye. Uh, and that's essentially what happened. How did you? How did Majestic react after that to you? Very angry. Uh, very angry, including um, the people with whom I'm the closest, uh, save the one present. Um, very angry toward me. And how do uh, they act? How does Majestic act when it's angry? Are, I mean, I, I guess this well, gets back to, weren't, haven't you been tortured? I mean, isn't this right? I wouldn't, I don't call it torture, aside from the fact that I've been falsely imprisoned. That's torture. I was, uh, um, for a couple periods of time, put at S4 in, in, in level three and basically told that's where you are for now. Um, level three meaning, was S4. it a cell? Uh, no, it, it was one of the, the rooms, one of the, the small suites, if you will, which were originally put in. Uh, there, there's 12 of them in this trident. There's, there's a, uh, three groups of four and, um, uh, I was put in uh, Bay Unit 1 over to the left, and uh, I, it was essentially, I mean, it, you know, contained all the amenities. I could ask for food. Got anything I wanted, except for I couldn't leave. There was no freedom. Um, I consider that torture. It, the other items are acts of unkindness. And acts of unkindness from Majestic can range from everything from psychological unkindness, being rude to you, to being threatening, to being physically harmful. And uh, I have been beaten, I have been slapped, I have been physically restrained, meaning handcuffed, and beaten and slapped. Um, Who, I have um, been put under uh, lights. Well, hell, I had friends doing that to me. But uh, I had, uh, uh, you know, put under intense lights and... Uh, uh, while being handcuffed, uh, as in interrogated. Uh, I have been told to shut my mouth 
to the point where um, two people grabbed me. One shoved me down onto the floor of a garage, and the other one stomped on and broke my hand. So, and these were the members of Majestic that carried uh, the, out these yes. attacks? Yes, in other words, not, they the, didn't not hire the J someone? numbers. Not the J numbers. These are operatives. Operatives. As in security personnel, yeah. I see. So not the not the one through twelve. But oh no! I, I, none them. of them have laid uh, an unkind hand on me ever. Um, great affection, if anything, out of them. But they were under but then orders. Again, one can show great affection to a pet. These okay. So you were viewed as a pet by some of them, but you were well, also I'm not mistreated saying that. I'm saying on their that, orders. I'm not saying I was viewed as a pet. I'm saying. I don't know what's, what they're truly carrying in their hearts, in their minds, and so there exists a possibility that affection can be granted either honestly or disingenuously. It can be granted uh, uh, um, person to person on the same level or uh, as an act of uh, uh, condescending. Well, let's back up a tiny bit. Well, Majestic. yeah, uh, she brought up the name Tenet. Uh, George Tennant. Cole, oh, I better watch my mouth. Mm -hmm. That's the way I hit the I name. I just started talking here too much. I know. George Tennant was a former uh, director of Central Intelligence for the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving on. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but what you were saying about Majestic has, has got me interested. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you're basically saying that Majestic is operating as independent of the government. Is that correct? Or are they operating yes and under no. the... Yes and no. Uh, they were, they were um, set independent of direct uh, presidential authority as far back as the late 40s. However, uh, there's more than one individual who sets, uh, who has set as a member of the Twelve, who are intimately involved with the United States government to include its highest levels. Okay, and so those people were oh, actually... I, okay, it's, it's time to put the tap dancing shoes on. <laughs> Okay, those people were actually ordering you to be, um, as a result, let's say, of, of this, over, you know, sort of overstepping the line, pushing J-Rod into the Stargate. They were ordering you um, to be uh, sequestered, to be uh, beaten or well, harmed uh, in some way. By the time that happened, all the beatings happened prior to that. By the time that happened, there was basically, they didn't know what to do with me. It took everybody so by surprise, me too, <laughs> what I did. They didn't know what to do, and so they really didn't. I mean, uh, you know, I got hauled around there at the site for a while, and I got hauled back here to the U.S., but I was basically, after that, just told to go home. They didn't know what to do. So uh, is this why you've been released from Majestic, is because of this no, incident? No. Um, it was coming near the end of my time, my usefulness basically anyway, aside from um, being a uh, almost an elder statesman with them, because I had been around for like 20 years. Um, my physical um, uh, condition has gotten worse, um, not well, physically. Um, so I would not be of any use inside of a laboratory. Okay, but why, why is there, I understand that there's been some kind of adjournment, according, there has been. Um, and now there's a new body, and it's not going to be comprised of the same people as no. the old body? True. Um, so True. why? Why have they changed members? Um, What's the motivation? There's a, uh, a, a switch over between two secret societies going on. One is handing reins over to the other, and it has been long planned. However, it's not been long known by me, uh, but it's been long, long planned, probably decades. Uh, I'm certain it has to have been for decades. So Majestic is ruled talk. by a secret society, is what you're saying? Well, Majestic has uh, been the most famous uh, 
next to probably the Freemasons, secret society of itself. And there are many of the Freemasons who inhabit uh, the Majestic as, uh, as a consequence of their relationships. Um, the two things are happening at the same time. And so their philosophies then, uh, the philosophies of these associated secret societies like the, the, the Scottish Rite and the York Rite, are then imparted into the secret society known as the Majestic. Um, so what's the quarrel between... you bring who you are to wherever you are. Sure. But what's the quarrel between, say, the Majestic Society or group and the Illuminati? Uh, that is a real good, and it's the, the best question to be asked. Even more importantly than the differences between the J-Rods, because this impacts us, I think, uh, now. Many members of the upper echelon, and I don't mean the hard-working people who work on construction sites, for God's sakes, but many people who are in the upper echelon of the Masonic movement, both York and Scottish Rite, uh, have accepted a philosophy uh, which is Luciferian in context and history. Many of the people who are not directly then involved with the Majestic, who are also associated with that Luciferian philosophy, have rubbed up against each other for decades, probably even longer. So somewhere along the line in history there was a schism between those individuals who have accepted a Luciferian uh, history, Luciferian philosophy, mixed with other secret society people who have not, that ended up in the Majestic and people who have accepted a Luciferian, most like a different uh, denomination, if you will, accepted a Luciferian philosophy, um, who are not associated with the Majestic. In other words, we've got dirty coins on both sides. Okay. And when you say a Luciferian now, philosophy... Uh, meaning, meaning a materialistic... Uh, and for lack of a better term, when it comes to the actual European Illuminati, satanic uh, philosophy, where they've given their lives, their families, their sacred honor to the, this satanic thought of uh, creating a world order under the person that they consider the true God, which would be a Luciferian figure. Now, these people have also separating them from the dirty coins in the majestic side. These people have also um, been accepting of the influence of the P-45 rogues who want to justify their own history by our demise of moving from timeline one over to timeline two, a catastrophe. And so the differences between the majestic group, some of which there have been these Luciferians mixed in, and the true Illuminati group, the, and they're not even really true Illuminati. I mean, that's a word that comes back meaning enlightened ones, and these people are not enlightened. They're simply under the influence of a false light. Uh, that, that the differences between the two, then, have raised itself to rancor, even though they share much in common with each other. However, on the majestic side, you have a lot of God-fearing people too. A lot, and, and I'm not talking about specifically here the 12, I'm talking about the line people, the people that we've worked with. Good people, good people to the, to the bone, to the soul. Uh, who, who want nothing but, but good for the world. So basically what you're talking about is there seems to be an alliance between, for
for lack of a better word, the so-called Illuminati group that that is uh, satanic um, followers, uh -huh. um, and the 40, P45s, what you call the P45s, mm -hmm. and the Majestic group, which even though it has some members from the Illuminati, basically is siding with the P52s. Yeah, I wouldn't really call them some. For, I, I would say that they 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 are Freemasons who have accepted the Luciferian influence. In other words, I personally disagree with it. Mm -hmm. The Luciferian influence, but are still acting as good people. For the benefit of humanity. For the benefit of humanity, exactly. Level. And then there are some that I've interacted with who are involved with the, the so-called true Illuminati in Europe that are God-fearing people too. There's dirty coins and there's polished coins on both sides. Uh, however, however, the dirty coins make up the vast majority of the group on the European Illuminati side. Okay, so what is, now let's get to, to the timelines and, and explain just briefly since this gets over into the future and yep. 2012, what the P-45s, meaning they are from the future, 45,000 years ahead of... 45,000 years ahead on a separate timeline than what we are presently on, but a timeline that we could transition over to from where we are now. So, if we are to accept that we transition, God forbid, from timeline one to timeline two, they would be considered 45,000 years and 52,000 years, respectively, ahead of us. The individuals who dumped near Roswell, New Mexico, back in the 40s, were approximately 24,000 years ahead of us in timeline two. And that was a mission return, an Earth-to-Earth -earth time, time travel mission. That uh, we're on timeline one, I'm assuming you're yeah. saying, and we're headed for 2012 and theoretically a catastrophe that may or may not happen. Right around now, yeah. Right around now. <laughs> yeah. And this catastrophe, has this got anything to do with Planet X? I don't know. There is the most honest answer I can provide you. I know of a lot of lore about a rogue planet coming in. However, the material that I've actually seen on a repetitive um, uh, crossing, if you will, of Earth with catastrophic influences happens not only because of a matter of physics, of rogue, and I don't mean this toward like J-Rod Road, but rogue crossings near Earth asteroids or comets. What I have heard is that to precipitate the catastrophe, there would be, as we pass into the plane of the Milky Way, some sort of energetic burst through the plane of the galaxy by virtue of wormholes that are traveling, that travel through the plane of the galaxy from the center of the galaxy, which have been depicted in ancient lore uh, called the, um, the serpent rope, even of the, uh, the ancients, uh, and that the serpent rope would return at the time of the end of the Mayan calendar, uh, revealing, and there are several perspectives as to what it will reveal. Um, but that during this same time, the history of the J. Rods record, that this burst will cause a disruption in the sun, and that concomitantly with uh, energetic bursts from the sun and from the wormholes which would be passing through our planet, that there would be a disaster provoked by virtue of these time travel devices, the Stargate devices, 
and the time viewing devices, the looking glass devices, spontaneously turning on and directing an inappropriate amount of energy into the crust of the Earth, precipitating a geophysical disaster. This geophysical disaster, in accordance with the history of the J-Rods, the Orions, record that over 4,157,000,000 die over a several year period by virtue of a geophysical shift in the crust. So this is, this is what I can't, I, is I, trying I to be... I get numb when I think of numbers that way. Is trying to be pre prevented. Is yes. this right? Yes. And, and how how is it going to be prevented? Uh, by the disabling and the destruction of such technology that we will naturally then pass through this the serpent ropes. The bursts will occur, whatever that means. I don't I haven't physically seen it. But the bursts will occur. And there would be an imparting of energy to our planet that will gradually, naturally cause changes in the human species and the life on our planet. And that these changes would be positive um, changes to our people. And I, I frankly think that it's already happening. There's a rise uh, worldwide. Uh, in in, and I don't think it's just a uh, given size of the, the population increase, um, but there is a rise in very spiritual, talented people. Um, there is a rise in uh, savants, the the um, the indigo children. It's a definitely from what I've seen from reading about them, uh, a real phenomenon. Um, these children are of a new time, and I think they're of the, the time one, timeline time. We're seeing, yeah, I think, in these children, these, these great kids, an expression of what we will be in our own future, our next kind of step ahead. You're not looking millions of years ahead or anything like that, but our next step ahead. And, and it's a, a wonderful rise in consciousness that um, I think will precipitate the next renaissance for our people. I see it happening. Uh, the, the numbers that we received before the looking glass was shut down, dismantled, uh, was that there would be a 19% probability with an 85% confidence that the disaster would occur that there would be a transition from timeline one to timeline two. But that then means that there is an 81% chance that it won't. And so the individuals who want to carry the, the negative, I'm convinced that it's going to occur, are not presenting the facts. The facts are this is the material that we have available that we know. So what you're saying is the Illuminati to get back to that thread, yes. is basically the side that believes that the transition is going to occur from one timeline to the other. Not only do they believe that it will occur, they want to provoke it. But but how does it benefit them to, to provoke it? Why yeah. should they want to be P-45s? They don't. The living ones don't. They're looking at the P-45s as, as a means to an end for them. They're not going to live that long. They're just going to live a normal human life and die. So they want the control for themselves. The fact that the P-45s, that's how immoral these people are. The fact that the P-45s are, are, are wanting us to, at their stage in their own development, have a disaster which, which justifies their own history, is being used as a means to an end by the Illuminati who would like to see that the population is called so that they can gain greater control. Don't care. So okay. So they just what? Want for themselves. They liter There are really human beings that don't care, or that care that little. So what you're saying is the the Illuminati want the catastrophe to occur. Yes. So that a certain number, three quarters is the number I've heard of humanity, dies. 
they well, get the, the history earth reads uh, about a little over two thirds. That's what the history okay, of the J rods actually read. All right, two thirds, and then what? I mean, they, they've still had to live through earth changes and cataclysms, right? Right. But these people are also the ones who have their guaranteed positions in the safety zones, underground facilities, etc. And so they are presumed. It is not known for certain, but they are presumed to actually then be the progenitors, if you will, of the people who become the J-Rods. understand. But in a sense, um there is a thought that, in a sense, the P-45s, that side of humanity is possibly becomes almost soulless. They become repressed. They still have their same souls because even after 7,000 more years of development, I, I could see the soul, I mean, as you see the heart of another human being, I could see the soul in Kaila. Kaila. So, it didn't but Kaela was not back. a P-45. No, he was a P-52. But that just means that he was 7,000 years along the T-2 timeline from when the P-45s so were he in used to be. he used to be, or his people used to be a P-45. Yes. And a P-46, 47, 48. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So the soul didn't go away and then come back. It's been there. But then, you know what? Look, you can say that some people are soulless. The Nazis. How much soul did they have when they threw my grandpa onto a car? How much soul did they have? We well, you know what they had a human soul. As black as what apparently what it was, or as covered over in their demented brains. But I still pray for them that they've even them, that they've made made whole with God. But they still had their souls, even though it was repressed. So, in like manner, the P-45s have a soul. Okay. Well, then, what... Okay, you've talked about the P-52 Orions and the P-52 J-Rods. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Okay. What causes the split? Because the Orions, I'm thinking, are the blonde Nordics. They're the ones that prefer to stay out of the safety zones when it happens. They are the survivors who do not go underground. Are these good? Is this a good division of humanity? I mean, the P-52 Orion Nordic. I don't consider Nordics. any division of humanity good. I consider them the more positive of the two, because I consider the positive aspects of humanity to be the spiritual aspects. So you're saying the Nordic line is spiritual? Yeah, more extremely, spiritual. Extremely. Yeah. Okay. So how does the Nordic line? I mean, you, you say they stay out. They actually move off from Earth first. The, the J-Rods, or the precursors to the J-Rods, stay on Earth for a great deal of time. Uh, well after 24,000 years from the time of the transition, like 24,000 years from now, because there were, there were 24, 24 or so thousand years ahead of us when they crashed in Roswell in 1947. Those were 24s. They stay. The Orions move off first to the place after the, the reestablishment of the society on the surface of the earth. Technology is refurbished, etc. They move off to the place where the Ark is held. Which the, is where? Our nearest body, the moon. The moon. Where on it, I'm not going to say. Okay. Um, well, this I'm gets having into... to defend against the possibility of timeline one transitioning over to timeline two in a manner different than I've been told, and I'm not going to be the person who hands off the wrong information. So, okay, but you're saying the Nordics are going to get off Earth if the catastrophe happens, or they, regardless. They they leave after. After the catastrophe yeah, happens. Uh, presumably several thousand years after it happens. They several leave. thousand they, years. Yes, oh, I was getting the, the impression you were talking about well, them really. going on spaceships or something. No. They move off to the moon several thousand years via spacecraft. They get to the place where the Ark was held, and they reestablish a new community. From there, they move to Mars. 
from Mars out to Orion. So the, we're talking a lot of time here. The face on Mars is is this this are we looking at something that was left behind by the Nordics? Mm -hmm. So we're as, looking as best forward. As I know. We're looking forward to our future when we're looking, we're looking at, at, paradox, at the ruins. Yeah, we're looking at a paradox of their ruins, which they left on another planet. In the in our future. In our future. In our possible future. Yep. Okay, well, to come back to this She's future... She's actually got the best command of this information of anyone in the public with whom I've spoken. I know. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's a very sweet um, thing to say. It's honest. Thank you. Um, we've got a... I'm getting another question here from our small audience, um, and I must say that that Bill Ryan is Bill O'Ryan, I'll be Ryan. <laughs> Bill Bill Ryan is also sitting with me and 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 listening to this amazing information and and asking some good questions. When we're looking at Mars, are we oh, Mars. looking at the future? Now the question I just is this: don't understand that. We're the to question, question, the question of of the day, is that what is going to happen? What is going to happen when the when the the transition occurs, and we either continue on one. Or, God forbid, number two happens. If number two happens, we're not going to be worried about Mars. <laughs> we will have much more important things to worry about at that moment. Let's say, God willing, and I think we will, remain on timeline one. What's going to happen with our imagery of Mars? I think we'll probably remember taking images of these anomalous structures. And there have been some anomalous structures imaged on the moon as well. So I think we're probably going to remember that. At least I think so. If we don't, it's not going to matter now, is it? So what you're but, saying is we're going to go back to the to the idea that we never that there are no there is no face on Mars. Or there will be a face on Mars and it will be presented to us at that moment as something different. Maybe the bricks will turn to rocks, and we will get there and find out that all of these beautiful ruins, including the, the, the scorpion, mm -hmm. if you don't think it's a scorpion, tell me what it is. Okay, I'll, I'll show you the images from, from Star City on the top of this pyramid. If it's not a scorpion, tell me what it is. But perhaps we're going to get there and we're going to find out that all of this presumed architecture that we are seeing by virtue of, of uh, the geometry that we're attempting to apply to these images is nothing more than rocks. That we've never been there. Because at that moment, because we had not trans transited over to timeline two, that we have never visited there until we finally put quote unquote man on Mars. But there's a profound okay. paradox here because there is because what I hear you saying is that we're looking through telescopes where we're receiving light in present time with a few minutes difference few minutes that's difference. being reflected off objects on the surface of Mars, but we're actually looking at a possible future. That's right. I don't understand. There are there are Im there are impacts into our timeline now, which have occurred. This is the information that I received not only from Kaela, but also from, from the material within Majestic. There are impacts into our reality now, our timeline now, by virtue of the amount of time travel which has occurred. Every time they have gone back in time, they have caused small paradoxes which have built up as our reality that we now perceive. In other words, there is actual Newtonian superimposing. And that is a frightening thing to me. So it's almost like putting money in the bank, though, every time they come from the P-45s, in a sense. Their timeline more becomes... As, as creating a larger heap of manure. Well, okay. but <laughs> <laughs> Emphasis appreciated. However, nonetheless, it is like a deposit towards the actual occurrence happening. It, I mean, I don't know. What, they are what, agents um, of change, in a sense. They are agents of change, as all human beings are agents of change. 
but I don't know whether there is a cause and effect, whether there's a nexus between cause and effect having to do with their amount of time travel in the, in the, the, uh, the super imposition which is going on in our reality and the disaster itself. I think that the disaster itself from everything that I've read and heard is a direct um, uh, consequence of the, the technological aspect of, of uh, bringing too much energy toward us in a non-natural manner. Okay, well, basically you're saying there's two timelines. I mean, I'm sure you're aware of the work of physicists now that are saying, look, if you can have two timelines, you can have two million. Well, don't we really have three or four? I'm discussing 24,000s, I'm discussing 45,000s, 52,000s, and present day. How many timelines are that? Because these people moved ahead linearly in their timeline. Just because we want to call it timeline two doesn't mean that there are other effects or, or, or super uh, imposings which are occurring on different realities during even their own timelines. Exactly. I, I mean, there's a sense at which what you're talking about is not so much that the P45s, for example, timeline won't exist, as it will actually separate from our reality and become more like a parallel reality instead of an in intersecting one. From what I understand, the people who were just prior, which would be us, according to their history, to the people who were just after, exist as a a, 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 a straight vector of time. Um, so in other words, God forbid the catastrophe occur, it will just appear as tomorrow the catastrophe occurs, etc., etc., and we move forward and changes start occurring in the earth. There is a disaster, there is a loss of, of huge life, etc. We won't probably feel anything change aside from the fact that we'll all be uh, running scared for our lives. Aside from that, I have no explanation. Okay, you're, you're saying if the catastrophe occurs. Yeah. But if it doesn't occur, there's still the element in which we have been visited by, by a, a timeline in which, which really does exist in a sense. I, I, and how do you unmake something which has been made? That's kind of, I mean, it's more of a philosophical I question. Don't, I don't know, and all I can do is defer to the Creator on that okay. issue. Because uh, all we do is perturb. What has told you that this is true? All of the above. Okay. It's all of the above, plus information directly from Majestic. I think. Why is Majestic in a, in a place to know that this actually happens or doesn't happen? In other words, you've got, you've got the looking glass technology that they use and you use, and you're well, instrumental in discovering. Were you in? No, 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 no. no. These, this, this is an original technology which was derived from ancient cylinder seals by people from our future who provided it to us, meaning the rogues, the P-45s. Okay, the people we from our negative future. We wouldn't have this lovely, that's right, we wouldn't have this lovely technology if it wasn't planted in our past for us to use now. The entirety of the technology must either be disabled or destroyed. In other words, to unmake the technology. Until at so least after we pass through this time period. Okay. Uh, there is no way from the, 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 the deceit, the conceit, the avarice, and the greed that I have been around over the last 20 years amongst the good side of these two dirty coins. There is no way that they're not going to start this equipment back up again if it's usable after this. Of course they're going to. Come on. I mean, they've got this, it's like a magic box to try to see into the future. What they're going to do with our future with, with regard to that, I've got no clue. I have no power over it, and I have no clue. Okay, so this looking glass technology comes from cylinder seals. Originally, yes. How? Uh, originally, it was a series of instructions for accessing... The, the wormholes, which naturally pass in the hyperspace in which we find ourselves. And from there, they worked on the technology. They built the equipment from the instructions. After building the equipment from the instructions, they began to tweak it and find different things out about it. One of the things that they found is that they could actually use it as a peering portal, like a peering glass, if you will, 
to see different aspects of not only the future but the past. Are these and Sumerian? Uh, Sumerian. Uh, I would say that they slightly predate Sumerian time frame, but that some of the information which came down from cylinder seals that slightly predated the Sumerian time frame were then recopied in Sumerian seals as well. And, and those, those cylinder seals, oh yes, and those cylinder seals, to the best of my knowledge, have all been um, obtained. From Iraq? Some of them from Iraq, yes. Some of them from some Egypt? Of them from other, some of them from Egypt, some of them from other countries where they were being stored. And and I really don't want to get my country into too many problems here. Who, uh, and and you've got uh, go ahead for a second. It's it's. I want to reiterate, the rogue P forty fives jumped back, seeded this technology mm -hmm. because that's what they wanted to do was to seed the, seed the uh, land to help facilitate the catastrophe because by placing this technology available they knew that um, it would be utilized and as long as we as people oh my god <laughs> the, they wanted to go oh, back please, and see the technology because they felt that as people we would be unable to break ourselves away from using that technology how is it that this technology is being utilized now and isn't, if you're talking about a wor wormhole, isn't it um, the same thing as a Stargate? Essentially, yes. The technology is not being utilized now. Anywhere we find it, we take it. Who's we? Because uh -huh. you have warring factions. You've we, got the Illuminati on one hand, you've got the Majestic on yep. another. We as the, we, we as the United States as part of the UN. NATO... Um, I don't really want to comment too much about NATO and who's controlling the uh, the, uh, the NATO alliance at this point, but um, isn't it a fact that the Illuminati we're doing most would be of the stealing lion's share. would be stealing back this looking? I mean, if they want it to happen, they they their objective would be to steal these cylinders and get them on you know so mm -hmm. that they could use the uh, yes, looking glass. Yes, but they can't technology. show up. They can't show up as an aggressor to steal anything back. So what they do is they vote against us. How does that well, stop it plays looking out glass in, it technology? Plays out, it plays out in the UN. Um, well, we had looking glass technology um, and uh, uh, portal, actual Stargate technology, in Iraq uh, as late as uh, the start of 2003. And um, a lot of countries don't want us to and didn't want us to enter Iraq. We did them, didn't we? Right. But how is it that, in well, other Mar words, it sounds well, like... Well, just handed his two over. We it's... just told him that we were going to make him rich beyond avarice. And he was a little smarter than uh, Saddam, that's all. And so what he did is he handed them over and says, Oh, please, come into my country. He says, look at my, look at my, uh, my equipment to make sure that I'm not making any weapons of mass destruction. Meanwhile, out the back door goes the two that Saddam actually had transferred over to him. Cylinders. Uh, well, uh, equipment, Stargate, Stargate, activating technology, Portal. yeah, for them to experiment with. They were experimenting. But if the looking glass technology is the same thing, it, uh, is is access as a wormhole? The technology Essentially accesses it does, a wormhole. Yes. Yes. It also accesses Stargates. Well, that's essentially the same thing. I, I, I've been using the term Stargate Stargates technology as occur. being a machine that accesses a wormhole by spreading out the energy, the strange matter, or whatever it is, and I'm not a physicist, that spreads it out in a compatible way to either communicate through it or well, passage of information. And that includes also... But it occurs, it occurs naturally. Stargates occur naturally. Indeed, they do. So how do you close those? You don't, and we don't want to. We don't want to. The history, the history reads that, that the natural passage of us through this energetic space is a good thing. But it's our use of technology which provokes the catastrophe. So it's, it's, it's our enhancement of this natural system, inappropriate enhancement, which provokes the catastrophe. And so, no, we don't want that to happen. I think that the, the, the energetics that, that we're passing through is part of what's 
happening to us naturally that's changing us in a positive way. It's part of the loving cosmos that we're part of. I think that's probably uh, one of the factors, not all, but one of the factors for the rise of the, these beautiful children, the indigo children. Uh, and, and I'm all for it. So we want to leave it. the stargates, the natural stargates, we wanna, they, we, they are leaving those alone. But we want to keep our hands up from nature. Pull our hands away, get it away from the fruit of the tree of life, so to speak. Get it away and just let nature happen during this time. That will be a good thing. However, we also have people who oppose that because they want what they want, what they want. Okay, so tell us sure. about... Uh, okay, well, the men in black phenomenon. The men in black, yeah. Part of it is the psychological operations unit within Majestic. And they operate to scare people away from things that they've seen that they don't want them, you know, further bringing information out in the population of the so-called giggle factor. Anything above that, they, they attempt or have attempted, I don't even know that they're still in operation, to suppress. Then you have the real McCoy. The real McCoy is not human. The real McCoy is in fact a P-45J rod. They are using, through the use of some sort of sinuous biomechanical technology, the skin of a dead human. Wow. It is a dead human. These are the ones that walk up to you and they look like they're shuffling, like they've just filled their drawers. Uh, when they speak through this technology that they have wrapping around them, they sound very bland, very monotone, and they don't belong. You can tell very quickly that they don't belong. Um, have you met one? I've met several of them. Uh, they were operating around um, my work at Sunchase before we were moved to a different location. Yes, they're very sallow in appearance. Um, they uh, thought that it was an appropriate expression to sing me happy birthday one year over at, uh, I think it was uh, the start of 2003. It was either 03 or 04. 03 I believe it was. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I did not like being around them, uh, and uh, they will not think twice but to use force on you. They will hit you. They will push you. One did me. Um, Marcia, uh, not uh, that long ago, got her fill of both types, both the psychological operations people who attempted uh, a few years ago to scare her off over at um, Winchester Park. These were Those were human beings. They were just striking fear in her. Uh, and one actual real McCoy, um, Nib. And um, this thing, I, I actually saw it first. It wandered onto, they get confused easily. That's a good thing. Uh, wandered onto our property uh, at uh, well, where we're presently living. And I was walking home from her apartment at the time. And I thought a child was swinging on the swing. There's a swing set out in front of my apartment. Um, the closer I got, I thought that it was a, a little older kid wearing black. And I noticed it had a hat on. And he said, swing, fun. He was lost in a memory, apparently, of the person that he was wearing. And I looked at him and got very afraid inside because they carry weapons. They can be killed with weapons, too. He was not supposed to be on our property, our security did not do its real job. We're not worried about the two-legged real humans that just walk around. It's these things. Um, so he was the size of a child, is that oh, what you're saying? No, he was, uh, 
he, he, I thought it was a child on the swing set as I was walking up. It was getting, it was past dusk. It was dark out there. So and he was a normal size. He was a normal size. Man. Yeah. Full grown person. Yep. Yeah, he was wearing all black uh, and a black preacher's type uh, hat. Round brimmed. How do you get rid hat. of him? Well, how do you get rid of yeah. him? Yeah. Um, well, it would be very good if a, if, if a person could actually... Well, I've got to be careful in suggesting that. Because mm -hmm. they are still human beings. Mm -hmm. um, they took him into... Security ultimately took him into custody. I just want to be careful liability-wise of, of making a suggestion on how to get rid of one of them. But... Um, um, people could miss Q and, right. and we wouldn't want to have a problem. No. Say, well, you know, Dr. Burrish said uh, do this or that. Um, there shouldn't be that many walking around to worry about. But, uh, and, it, and it wasn't even sent there to deal with me. It was sent there to deal with her. And it found itself apparently lost in a memory um, in the swing set. And I said, good, swing to it. And inside of going, oh, shit. Walked in, keyed the door to my apartment, pressed the emergency button for security, hoping then that they were going to respond. Went in and told my, uh, my mother-in-law what was going on. She looked out of the window and said, yep. Yeah. She's been in the Majestic family all of her life. She said, yeah. Then uh, the oldest got up, looked out the window, and said, that's what one looks like. It was her first experience seeing one. I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, Doris, uh, go over here. And I unlocked something, and I pulled something out for her. And I said, while I leave here, because I'm going to do the hurt bird routine, lead it away, because, I mean, we three kids in there. I said, I don't know what its intention is. It may have a, a, um, a lethal intention here, and it's just presently lost. As soon as it gets done swinging, it may pull a weapon out. I said, so if it comes near here, defend yourself and defend the kids. Meanwhile, I'm going to grab something else. Yes, I grabbed a weapon, and I'm going to try to lead it away. By the time I had the second weapon out and was armed, it was walking off already toward her <laughs> apartment's direction. So I said, okay, well, I still have to get it in case it turns around, because if it knows where I went into the apartment, I have to lead it away because there are kids in here, there's little girls in here. Uh, and so I walked toward it, past it, <laughs> walked clear by it, and it just continued shuffling ahead slowly up the sidewalk, gradually toward her apartment. Got over to her apartment. I said, where in the hell is security? So we were pushing buttons over there. Nobody's responding. Got on the radio. Nobody responds. I said, you have a MIB walking toward your apartment right now. She said, a MIB? I said, an ET. I said, they are dangerous, as you're well aware, but you know, it's her first experience with something. Um, I said, come here, look, it can't possibly, and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't walking back toward my apartment where the girls were. I said, it can't possibly have reached here by now. <laughs> I mean, it's walking slowly. And uh, so she came out with me, and uh, she went over by the, uh, the wall behind a, um, a bush, and uh, she didn't see it initially. It was hidden like in the recesses of the light as it was walking up in one of the, um, the um, shadowed areas because now the lights had kicked on the exterior of the buildings all of that and I walked up onto the sidewalk and saw it and I turned my back on it at that point they don't run so I turned my back on it and I said you may want to be going that way to Marcy and she said, because uh, she's not the faint of heart, uh, female, she said, why? And then she saw it over my shoulder and got her first, laid her first eyes on an ET. And 
ultrasound, her eyes got about that big, which is the normal reaction. And she walked. To give you some credit. She actually walked from there back toward the corner of the building um, before I saw her break into something more than a walk. She walked away from it. By then, I'm still standing there and this thing walked by me. Now I'm wondering what, why it's here. And I said, hi. And it turned this close to me and said, hello. And then just continued to walk. Walked right past me like I wasn't even there. Toward her. And I thought, well, okay. It has an assignment. We don't know what the assignment is because it will not give up its intention behaviorally before it carries out its assignment. And I wasn't sure if it was armed or what, so I walked by it again. This is how slow it is shuffling. It walks like it's got poops in it, poop in its pants. I mean, that's how you can, I mean, they are, they are clearly not comfortable in the skin. I walked by it again. Now I have made certain adjustments to the firearm I had on me. Because I was figuring that whatever was going to happen, it was going to happen fairly soon. And if it pulled a weapon out, I was going to do what I learned in the police department and do it well uh, for parole probation. Got back to her, got all the way into her apartment, locked the door. I then said, I said, you go get your gun. If it pulls a weapon out, you've been a former cop too, do what you do and do it well. By that time, we were both shaking, figuring you know it was going to turn into something very bad. It sat down on the stairway outside of her apartment, and it had a bag with it. It was a black bag of some sort, and I didn't know what was in it. It could have been anything. And it just sat there. And then it got up, and it walked past her apartment. And now I'm looking at her like, what the this. Still no security. Finally, after it, it had made its way all the way to the, the um, basketball court area, and stood there and looked around, still confused, security came up with its weapons, drawn, and took it into custody. Put it in one of the vans, and off it went. It cuffed it. Like a human being would be cuffed, and they took it. She got a couple photographs off. We actually, because it walked down toward the court, uh, I was looking through the window and said, Well, there's no way it could hit us from here, even if it does have a gun on it or whatever. Um, she stepped out onto her porch and she took a couple photographs. Uh, with a, it was a disposable. Was, I found a disposable camera. It was up on the bookshelf near the door, oh, and I just disposable. grabbed it. And there was a. That's all I had. She she took a couple photographs of it, and we have since made those public on the Eagles Disobey forum. Those are real. It's the real shoot. McCoy. The best I could do. The enhancements that show one after another with it. You know, bringing it out from the background. Those are the best enhancements I could do because the original photographs that we put up there too, you saw, I mean, it was just basically jet black. Mm -hmm. There was no carrying of the flash, and it was not set for, uh, you know, night speed or anything like that. It was a, an indoor-outdoor type daytime camera, a disposable camera, but it was all that was available. Now, security took photographs and all of, and all of that, but they don't share them. Right. At the same time, I was doing my weekly reports, and I detailed it in my weekly report. And I allowed that weekly report to be made available, too, where I said, you know, the MIB was taken into custody and no one was injured. But, uh, yeah, he just walked onto her property. Assignment, still to this day, unknown. Mm. Well, following 20 years of service for the Majestic, last October the 12th, which was October the 12th, 2005, was dismissed at the time of their adjournment to complete a, um, a final set of orders, if you will, to present the information which uh, I had learned over the last 20 years concerning the extraterrestrial intelligences. 
um, to the world or to whomever wanted to hear. Uh, for the last year's time, we have been um, uh, committed to a debriefing of um, my service since 1986, and even actually before that, uh, we've, we've ranged uh, to um, uh, speaking about my early life as well. Um, we're hoping that within a short period of time, DVDs will be completed and uh, this will be presented. And, this will then conclude my service to Majestic uh, with a very big relief and thank God. Um, uh, right now we are presently in the middle of several different projects, um, inclusive of which is um, Project Lotus, which has basically been dispatched and dismissed to me after uh, uh, the years of service as well. Um, this Meaning project, it was turned over to you? Well, it, it's been turned over. I, I don't think that the, that, uh, the folks from the former Majestic are continuing to research at all. I, I, re, I, I really don't think that they want anything to do with it after the um, problems that we've had and uh, associated problems at, at a couple different facilities um, involving, we'll say, extraneous energy emissions around the project. Um, so, have caused some damage to their equipment. Um, well, to back up a tiny bit, could you tell us what is Project Lotus? Sure. Uh, in in May of 2001, we traveled to Frenchman Mountain here in Nevada to begin a real project looking for a biomarker uh, for a possible uh, precursor virus. It was a rather prosaic uh, study looking for evidence for panspermia. Um, during the course of that initial investigation, we came across some anomalous activity uh, in some of our data sets. That anomalous activity was ultimately tracked down to um, very unusual electromagnetic activity associated with uh, silicon oxides. Um, and we have since tracked that anomalous activity to any silicon oxides uh, present in minerals. Uh, to wit, the, the, um, the activity is the presence of an emission of electromagnetic bundles containing information. Um, we are presently attempting to further define the nature of uh, that electromagnetic anomalous activity. But we have, in fact, determined that the activity is associated with um, cells within the terrestrial environment uh, and that they have effects upon cells in our terrestrial environment up to and including modifying the genetic material of extant cells in our environment. Are you uh, saying living cells? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have, uh, together with these electromagnetic uh, emissions that we have defined with uh, um, relative precision to date to be specific varieties of what we termed as particles. We had to call them something. They're bundles of electromagnetic material, confined uh, discrete bundles that we believe are possibly related to uh, as far back as the ancient Pavitrakas of the Hindus, uh, subtle matter particles, which could be imparted into our environment and affect changes. Um, thus far, we have not uh, observed negative changes, uh, meaning the effects of these uh, um, subtle matter particles, if you will, have not affected um, uh, our environment negatively. But you have had interruptions as a result of those particles well, we've in had, anomalous activity, you said. We've had, we've had anomalous um, uh, thermal emissions when too much or too little um, energy was imparted to the um, uh, silicon oxide bearing material. Uh, we have had unusual drains of uh, um, batteries mm -hmm. around the activity. Uh, and have not defined why, but but there have been two phenomena associated with uh, a lotus that 
have been particularly striking to me as a, as a biologist. We've had resets of cells which have occurred, and I say resets because I'm trying not to make it sound Frankenstein-like, um, where there have been heat-fixed uh, yeast cells which have been used as uh, um, offered, if you will, to this phenomenon as, as target cells. And upon the receipt of material of these dead heat-fixed uh, yeast cells, we've had a restart of, of the cells, uh, and we have the, the photographic and the... So they've the, come uh, back to life, is what you're saying, as a result of this... There has been a... a um, yes. I really don't even like using those terms. It's, it's out of the book, off the edge of the pizza, so to speak. Um, but we have had a restart of, of uh, the cells in that location. However, the cells which have restarted from the dead cells are not the same cells, are not the same uh, function functioning cells as the the uh, precursor cells, the precursor yeast cells. We don't really know what uh, they are. You mean? Are you saying that the cells changed and they're functioning differently after being exposed to this? Yes, uh, we started out uh, with a essentially a, uh, a fungal cell, a budding yeast cell, which we heat fixed, and the result was more uh, a termed a, um, what one would normally term an animal-like cell. Really? So it actually yes. changed it from one thing. It actually transformed it from one thing to another. It transformed it from one thing to another uh, after imparting to it what we've come to call a template. Um, there and is, is an actual the... imparting of uh, DNA ah. to the cell. So we're receiving DNA essentially across some sort of a an electromagnetic barrier uh, through these these what we call portals, these emissions of um, electromagnetic uh, energy that that then impart further discrete bundles of electromagnetism to our environment. So is and we're attempting to understand it. We don't understand what we are truly looking at at the moment. We've not fully defined uh, the Lotus as a system. Okay, but is this, are the, the particles, are these the Ganesh particles that are coming through? We've, de we've defined three basic discrete varieties of particles uh, that we have turned, uh, termed um, alpha, uh, beta, and, uh, and C-type. Uh, particles. The A-type particles um, were nicknamed Ganesh particles. And that's what they are, they're nicknames. We had to call them something, so we called them Ganesh particles. Uh, out of a, a historical uh, deference, if you will, for the, the mover, mover of obstacles. Um, and we called the, the, uh, the portals Shiva portals. There's an opening or a changing uh, these are the, the uh, admission or uh, emission centers, if you will, for these Ganesh particles. And then we have still another variety of um, um, particle, which we call selkies, and uh, Marcia actually named them. These are C-type uh, particles, and they basically act as um, almost like crossing guards. Hmm which line the, the periphery of a, an electromagnetic magnetic stream that leaves these portals and basically act as, as um, guards or guideways um, surrounding the Ganesh particles, giving them a pathway to a target. Now the real question I think is, is how is the decision being made for a target. And we, we've identified on, on these selkies what appear to be acoustic antennae. And I say appear to be acoustic antennae because changes of, of input into this system, acoustic changes, affect the behavior of these selkie particles. Sound, in other words, yes. sound is affecting the selkie particles causing them to redirect uh, the energy towards a target or away from a target? Causing them to redirect their positions 
which confine an electromagnetic stream or a river, if you will, being emitted from these portals. And, and you know, we've wondered what the portals are. They might be micro wormholes. Okay. We don't know uh, right now. For and, sure. are, and these are nano sized portals? Is that uh, no, these are, these are microscopic okay. sized. Um, somewhere within the, the 20 to, um, uh, well, I'd be very transient up to 50, but around the, the 10 to 20 micron size, micrometer size. And so they're observable quite readily under a compound microscope if the conditions are held constant and if um, um, they are treated delicately. They're extremely transient uh, phenomena. In other words, you don't have a control over them. No. No. And in fact, um, we don't do uh, any direct uh, propagations anymore. Uh, the last, the last uh, direct propagation was done last November, and we received it for the second time an anomalous growth of cells in the medium surrounding the crystal that we were using. We were using a quartz crystal uh, because of the, the, uh, the silicon oxide nature of the quartz crystal. Um, and we received a, a, an anomalous growth of cells of unknown origin around the crystal. So we do not know where these, these cells were from. Uh, we've had that happen now twice and uh, we've determined that we're, we're getting a little too good, if you will, at the science of propagating these portals and we're possibly receiving a negative consequence as a result. In other words, those could actually be um, an alien life form. Indeed. Indeed, they could, they could be extraterrestrial. Um, cells, the, the, I mean, the, they're microscopic, the cells, right? So. Right. I mean, you know, we, we, we've received a mix of very unusual cells, which we were not, I was not able to, to you know, cytologically type, uh, and also cells which appeared nearly prosaic to uh, our ocean here. Um, microscopic one-celled uh, organisms, haptophytes. Um, but they that, came out of nowhere. Um, the material that we had provided um, to the to the experiment uh, prohibited a cross contamination. The ability for this to have been a cross contamination. So they they came from somewhere. They came from somewhere. Now, also, um, what we've done is um, a repeat of a, a very famous experiment called the Spallanzani experiment with beef broth, but we, we put a, a tweak on it, if you will. Uh, in, in the Spallanzani experiments were experiments designed to either prove or disprove the idea of spontaneous generation. And so the question is then begged, are we exhibiting spontaneous generation here. And I, I think that we have uh, zero uh, evidence that this, is, that this is spontaneous generation. And allow me to explain why. The Spallanzani experiment that we repeated, we did it exactly the way the, the famous uh, experiment was originally done, with beef broth that had been boiled, but we actually had it autoclaved, uh, so that we had pressure and heat both acting on it. Uh, getting rid of all the spore formers, everything that could have been present in there as a living um, um, organism. Uh, we left some open, some closed, and then we did a closed and an open experiment where we applied electricity and a silicon oxide bearing crystal to it. And in the case where we had the closed uh, study done, we received the growth of cells in that closed study, uh, which appeared to me uh, to be neural cells and organized neural cells uh, to the point where we could actually tell morphologically that there was an ABAB pattern which was developing. Um, I wouldn't say that I was in a panic but uh, Marcia is nodding her head rapidly off the <laughs> camera. I was in a near panic.
to cease the study then and there so that we weren't accidentally producing something with sentience. Wow. Not my right, that would have been a, um, an abomination of some variety. Uh, I don't practice um, the tools of science devoid of um, um, moral considerations. Some nowadays, I think, uh, have no problem, no compunction against that, I do. Um, so the, the study was ceased immediately and the cells were photographed. Yes, we have the photographs of them, but uh, the study was ceased and um, it, was, it was killed immediately. Okay, well this is, this is really um, kind of earth-shaking information that mm -hmm. you've got here. And mm -hmm. now that I'm, I'm getting it uh, in a way that, that I understand it makes it very clear. Wow. But, um, uh, thank you, Dan. That was uh, quite, quite enlightening.